Now let's argue the other side. So it clearly sounds like to me like, yeah, you know what? The government shouldn't be involved in the economy. Well, not so fast. So let's give you an example of the Panic of 1893. I'm not going to go completely into the details of the Panic of 1893, but I'm gonna, I'll go into in-depth details in another video. But for this, let's just give you the basic gist of what happens here. So as I explained to, to you earlier, 150 years ago, if you wanted to ship anything, you had to use the railroads. There weren't roads. You didn't have semi-trucks. You didn't even have automobiles yet. So if you wanted to ship something, you had to use the railroad. That means railroads are really important and everyone's got to use them. So they're pretty valuable. Wouldn't it be cool to own some of the railroad? They're always making money. Why not buy some of that railroad and get rich? Right? It's like right now, if you own a little bit of Facebook, you know, everybody uses YouTube. Everybody's got to use YouTube. Boy, it would have been nice to own some of that YouTube. Same thing back then. Everybody had to use the railroad, so it would have been nice to own the railroad. Well, guess what? You too can buy some railroad. I'm selling railroad. And so these guys are investors and they're like, all right, cool. We'll give you some money. And now we own a share of the railroad. They are partial owners of the railroad. So every time the railroad makes money, boom, money in their pocket. That's awesome. They are investing in a worthwhile business. That's good. Until the entire economy collapses because of the railroads. <laughs> Again, I'll go into the panic of 1893 and explain it in more detail, but the whole thing crashes. The railroads become worthless. So basically, it goes out of business, bankrupt, boom. Railroads not even running anymore. And I'll explain this kind of in detail in the next slide. This is called the Panic of 1893. And I'll go into more detail in an extra video. But all the railroads just shut down. All of a sudden, all the railroads shut down. They stop running. And cool, you own part of a railroad that doesn't sell tickets. You own part of a railroad, the train is completely parked. And eventually they just have to sell the train away because the guys that own the railroad are all in debt. And the whole thing just, boom. You, you have a piece of paper that says you own part of a railroad that no longer exists. So basically you have nothing. The money is gone, the entire economy collapses. Bad news. It's kind of an argument for, well, maybe if the government was involved, they could have prevented all this. Maybe they could have invented, prevented some of these bad investments, or maybe they could have put some safety measures in play. So not just everyone loses everything and the entire economy collapses and all the banks go under. I mean, this thing is huge, it's bit, much bigger than these guys losing investments. Imagine all the banks are gone, just suck all the money out of the economy, crashes the entire economy. Maybe the government should have kind of got involved there, right? You know, maybe we don't want the hand, laissez completely hands off because sometimes when you let the market do its thing, mistakes can be made. So to let you understand how this can happen, you're like, wait, how can all this just disappear? How can the railroads just become bankrupt? They were really successful. The railroads were good. Everyone had to use the railroads. You just told me there weren't roads. Everyone had to use railroads. Okay, well, imagine this. Today, you open a pizza place, or well, let's just say somebody opens a pizza place, not you. They are the only pizza place in town. If you want pizza, you got to go there. They're probably making a lot of money. Then all of a sudden someone else realizes, well, look at that guy. He's making a bunch of money on pizza. I'm opening a pizza place too. And still you got two pizza places in town. They're competing against each other, but there's still plenty of hungry people in this town. So you're making plenty of money. Yeah, you're not making as much. He's not making as much as before, but they're still making money. There's plenty of pizza sales to go around. All right, well, a little bit less. We got guys competing each other. Now all of a sudden I used to charge $10 for a piece of pizza. Now I'm charging $9 because I got to compete with these guys because they lowered their prices. Still doing all right. There. Three pizza places, we good. Okay. All right, guys. We got to chill out with these pizza. Okay. Oh, no. We no longer Gucci. Got a problem. All these pizza places are competing against each other. Now all of a sudden we got $5 hot and ready and I'm not even making any money when I'm selling pizzas. And oh, what are we doing? You say, that's crazy. No one in their right mind would be so stupid to open a bunch of pizza places in a town that could only really support maybe three or four. Well, guess what folks? It happens all the time. And that's exactly what happened with the railroads. There's a basic rule. When supply goes up, price goes down. When the supply of something, when something is no longer rare, it's a high supply, the value of it goes down. If you don't believe me, just flip it around. When the supply goes down, the price goes up. When something is rare, 
It's very expensive. When there was only one pizza place in town, the price was higher. Then when you had a bunch of different options, a bunch of different to choose from, all these pizza places fighting, the price of the pizza went down. Things that are rare, like gold, diamonds technically, Yeezy, something that is rare, is valuable. If there's a lot of it, like Velcro shoes, you can get those for five bucks at Walmart. When the supply of something is really high, the price goes down. He give you tons of examples, and you know plenty of examples from your life of things that are in high supply or are not rare. Silly bands are probably worth a penny. Fidget spinners. Remember when those things first came out? They're like five, ten bucks. Now they're everywhere, and you can get a fidget spinner for twenty-five cents. You get them out of the quarter machine in the grocery store. The supply went up. The price went down. Same thing happened with railroads. So this is good for consumers, right? If you were buying pizza, it's awesome. I can get pizza for almost nothing, but it's bad for the producer, the business owners, and the investors, not Gucci. Stop saying that, you weirdo. <laughs> Sorry. The pizza places are eventually all going to go out of business. Ah, oh, we're dead, we're dead, we're dead. Kill them, dead, 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 dead. Oh, no pizza. So they're all gone. Eventually, you're left with no pizza anymore. Well, the same thing happened with the railroads. So you got very few railroad routes. So this is not specific, but this is just to show you. Well, I mean, kind of is. The next one you'll see is a real representation of all the railroads. So right here, what I want you to imagine is low supply of railroads. You don't have a lot of options railroad-wise. So low supply, that means high price. If I want to go to Sacramento, to Salt Lake, there's just one route. So whatever this guy charges me to go here, I got to pay it. I ain't got no options. If I want to go from Chicago to DC, there's just one route and I got to pay whatever he's asking. Now all of a sudden we got all these routes and look, look how many different ways I can go from Chicago to DC. A lot of different options and you got different railroads competing with each other. Just like you had the pizza places competing with each other, you now have railroads competing with, competing with each other to the point that they drive the prices so low that they're not making money and they're not making money. They can't even afford to hire the workers. They have to fire all the train workers. They have to just shut the railroad down completely and go out of business. That's what happened. It's good for the consumer for a little while because it's really cheap getting a railroad ticket. But then when all the railroads got a business, then you can't even go anywhere. That gives you an idea of the panic of 1893. Now it gets really low that a couple guys go in because the prices of these railroads are actually basically worthless. A couple dudes buy all the railroads and that causes some serious problems. Competition and collusion. Again, sometimes you need government involvement. Sometimes you don't need government involvement. Burger King and McDonald's compete every day, and that's good. And you don't need the government to get involved. You don't need the government to get involved with Burger King and McDonald's. When Burger King and McDonald's compete, it results in better prices. Just like I showed you with the Pizza Huts competing against each other, the prices were going down. Burger King wants to sell more cheeseburgers, they'll lower the price to 90 cents. McDonald's wants to compete, they'll lower their cheeseburgers to 75 cents. Well, then they want to compete, so they lower it to 60 cents. That's great for you consumer-wise. Now, if they don't want to lower prices, maybe they'll just go with quality. They'll add more meat. They'll add more condiments. They'll add, oh, uh, who knows, different sauces, different flavors. They'll throw in chicken nuggets. They do different things to compete with each other. Competition is good. If you only had Burger King, you would not have this competition. Now, the problem is when the businesses get smart and decide to collude. Collusion is a secret alliance by businesses. McDonald's and Burger King don't like that the prices got driven down. They don't like that, man, I was selling cheeseburgers for a dollar, now I'm selling them for 60 cents. That ain't cool. And it's all your fault, Burger King. And Burger King's like, no, it's all your fault, McDonald's. I had to compete with you, and now I gotta give them an extra milkshake. It's killing me. Well, then what they decide, and this happened with the railroads, the railroads all secretly worked together and said, look, you knuckleheads, we're killing each other here by competing. We're driving the prices down. It's great for the consumer. It's great for the guy riding the railroad. It's great for the farmer shipping his corn, but it's not good for us. Here's what we're all going to do. We all agree that no one will charge less than $5 to get on a train. Now, we got to keep this secret because we're violating a lot of these laws 
of capital markets and free markets. We're not supposed to do this stuff. And if the government finds out that we are cheating the people, they might get mad because the government is the people and, you know, they get kind of upset about that. So let's not let the government or the people know. Let's just secretly wink, wink. We're all going to charge $5. That's called collusion. And they would get away with it if the government does not get involved. And collusion happens every day in big markets and in small markets. You may see this in your town where it seems like every business is charging the same price. Now, a lot of people accuse gas prices of doing this. Now, they don't really do that. That's a mistake. But a lot of people believe that gas stations, they're all charging $1.50. What happened to competition? Well, $1.50, what, what year is this? They're all charging $2.80. It's nonsense. Why doesn't one of the gas stations lower their prices and compete? This is collusion. They're all setting a price floor. And it doesn't really work that way with gas. It's a little more complicated. But that is an example of helping you understand where you can see why are you all charging the same price for milk? I don't get it. That's collusion. And you need government involvement in the economy to prevent that type of collusion. So the question is, does laissez-faire work? Should the government be completely hands-off in the economy? Just like everything in social studies, the answer is never yes all the time, and it's never no all the time, and most of the time there never is an answer. The answer is sometimes. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it does not. And that almost always is the answer in social studies. Sometimes, always. Give you an example of a monopoly, or we also call these a trust. This is when one... Business controls all of one product. A monopoly, I like the board game. For example, in Monopoly, when you control all of one set of real estate, you get to jack the price up. A monopoly is when you control all of one product. So let's work our way to this understanding. So if you got Coca-Cola competing against Sprite, competing against Mountain Dew, these are not monopolies. These are different sodas competing against each other for you to purchase them. And in the end, you get all these prices are dropping because they're competing. Coca-Cola has to lower the price to sell. Sprite, Mountain Dew, Pepsi, they are competing. This is an example of multiple businesses competing against each other. A monopoly is going to be where there's just one business that controls all the soda. In this example, this is not a monopoly. We've got a bunch of different sodas competing against each other. And the result is we've lowered the prices. Or, like we talked about with McDonald's and Burger King, not only do they compete in lower prices, but they compete and add to quality. We get different options. Cactus Cooler can't afford to lower the prices. So what they say is, well, we'll give you extra caffeine for that extra kick. Or Pepsi says, we're going to use real sugar, not high fructose corn syrup. This is healthier for you. I thought sugar was bad. Shh, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't you dare, dare disparage sugar. Sugar is the best. Yay, sugar. So competition leads to better prices. It also leads to better quality. It's awesome. Well, what happens when you don't have a competition? You don't have sodas competing against each other for your consumption. You got one soda. Monopoly. A monopoly is one business controls all the products. So imagine that there's only one soda you can purchase, Coca-Cola. And if there's only one soda, there aren't any competition. So guess what? If they decide 125, that's what you pay. You know what? It's $1.50 now. What are you going to do? Don't buy it then. There are no other options. We control all the soda. All our bases are belong to us. They can put poison in it. There ain't nothing you can do about it. There is, there's no competition. There's no one forcing them to make better soda. There's no one competing with them to lower the prices. Monopolies are not good. And they've happened and they continue to happen. And there is only one entity that can stop a monopoly from forming in our country. If you don't have government involvement in the economy, you'll get monopolies. And monopolies will jack up prices. Monopolies don't necessarily build good products because they're the only one. You get rid of government, you get rid of the ban, and you make the government become involved in the economy. They pass antitrust laws. Again, trust is another word for monopoly. Anti meaning against and law meaning a law. So we make laws that say monopolies are illegal. You cannot own all of one product you cannot be the only company in the country that makes cell phones we have hundreds of different well you've got 10 or 12 different cell phone companies you got a bunch of different cell phone coverage providers at&t versus verizon versus sprint you've got a bunch of different operating systems well we've 
We got Android and iPhone and Apple, so at least you got a couple competing. You got a bunch of different computers. You got a bunch of different cars. Imagine there was only one car. Well, then that one car company could decide what you were going to pay for, and they would only make one car. They wouldn't have to make a bunch of different cars. If I go to the car lot right now, I can buy cars. I can buy SUVs. I can buy different versions of SUVs, five different versions of trucks because of competition. And I get that because the government said monopolies are illegal. No one can own all of one product. So defend or criticize government involvement in the economy. Hopefully you'll have a good idea of how you can say, well, sometimes the government should get involved in the economy. And sometimes the government needs to stay out of the economy and let the people and the producers figure it out on their own. Laissez-faire literally means hands off. The government is not involved in the economy. And a monopoly is when one person owns all of one thing. You have not necessarily seen this, a full-blown monopoly in your life but you've seen close to it where one producer owns almost all of everything and they can control the market. They can control the price. We don't have a complete monopoly because the government is involved in the economy.